Um, we are we are at the the Episcopal Church of the Epiphany um, for lots of reasons because this is a warm and welcoming congregation, and because as we said earlier, this congregation has been for at least ten years, probably more than that. I can't remember exactly how many years has been preparing meals for the residents of Peachtree Pond and bringing and serving those meals every third Friday. And we did a, an Academy Award presentation two years ago where the residents decided on awards to all the volunteer groups who bring meals and serve. And this was the church with the best food. In fact, <laughs> in fact, it was, it was christened the beef tip church because everybody, you know, they, we don't always get good meat in, in our meals. We have a lot of carbs and they're great. Obviously, I like them. But this particular church has, has had the reputation from the very beginning of being the church with the best food. <clears throat> okay, we have... We want to do introdu introductions are more important to us than anything because we get to hear from each person and each organization here what we're doing. And we have some, we always have some new folks. So we will start with the new folks. And I'll ask this, you know, I'm, I'm bad about this. I'll ask you to come up and talk on the spur of the moment and expect everybody to be just so glad to do that. So we have with us. Um, a whole table of mercy, mercy care, mercy health care. But I want all. Of, I want the table, if you will, if you're not eating, to stand up and introduce yourselves. And then I'd like then Robert Mason to come and tell us what's going on in mercy. I want to stand up. Some of you come regularly. I'm regular. I'm Mary Watson from St. Joseph Mercy Care Services. You know how much outreach program. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Mary. And I'm Stan Silk from St. here, also with the outreach. Stan, just for fun, how long have you been coming to these meetings? Oh, my God. Well, I have to go back to the past. I mean, I've yeah. been all for a, year, for a few years, but I have recently not been here, and so I'm back. We're glad to have you back. Welcome. We've missed you. So that's the last time. I came back two years ago. Good. Thank you. My name is Roxanne. I'm the screening person that goes out with the outreach team. I'm Robert Mason. I'm the director of the community for St. Joseph's Church. I'm Devon Martin, and I am a mental health case manager, and I also did my AmeriCorps attachments for the homeless. Mm -hmm. And say the rest of what you did. Oh. <laughs> 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 and me doing my um, AmeriCorps internship at Task Force for the Homeless had paved the way for me to be a mental health case manager and to work with the homeless population. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do that now? Yeah. Yes, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I, too, um, one time I was a regular and I have a meeting conflict, and so I come when I can to this meeting, but I'm always excited and glad to come because I get to see folks I haven't seen in a while. And so, um, at Mercy Care, we just, we just did some expansion in our program. Mercy Care in October. I'm sorry. Yeah, October celebrated 25 years of service to the community, uh, providing health care and other services to the homeless uh, in the city. Um, we um, ex did some expansion of our, uh, of our clinic downtown. We've added some more expansion to accommodate our vehicles. We've uh, enhanced our clinic by adding X-ray and uh, ultrasound. Um, expanded our exam rooms. So we've done a lot of work at Mercy Care uh, over the past year, uh, and so uh, we welcome you to come, not only to see what we do there, but to come and, but to uh, refer clients there for medical care as well as dental services. Every Thursday is Open Dental Access Day, uh, and by that I mean that uh, on Thursdays, if you have a client who is in need of dental care, just send them to Mercy Care. They don't need an appointment. Uh, we will see them. You know, it would be nice if they brought a shelter letter with them, but if they don't have that, uh, or a letter indicating they're homeless, if they don't have that, we will still see you, so uh, see them. So please uh, refer folks to, to the dental program. Um, 
five years, four years ago, I think it was now, maybe five, um, we started doing a, a moral uh, candlelight vigil for homeless folks who died. And we know that the task force does that on um, uh, November 1st, is that correct? Mm -hmm. uh, All Saints uh, uh, Day. And uh, we, we do this, uh, was encouraged to do it in conjunction with the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council and uh, the National Coalition, the National Homeless Coalition. And so we do that on uh, December 21st, which is the uh, first uh, day of winter and the longest night. And, uh, and we keep it pretty straightforward and, and, and simple. It's an outdoor program where we have a very short program, uh, say a few prayers, uh, and we involve the homeless in the agenda. And um, we um, call the names of homeless folks who died and we light a candle in their, in their, in their honor. And then we, we, and that's it. And then, so it runs for about 30 to 40 minutes, and we welcome you uh, to that. It, by no means, in no way, does it take place uh, uh, than what the task force does. They do a wonderful record, and I've been to that. That St. the Cathedral of St. The Cathedral, that's how we the tongue twisted for you. The Cathedral of St. Uh, so, um, those are some of the things we're doing at Mercy Care. Um, St. Joseph Mercy Care Services, and we welcome you, and we'd love you to come and see our next place. Thanks. Maybe y'all can host a meeting for us. Oh, we, I think we can. All yeah, right. I, will, uh, I hate to put you on the spot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, you know, we have a, uh, uh, we've added and expanded our uh, boardroom. We used to um, have a boardroom that just was not large enough to accommodate all of our staff. Uh, when we do something uh, like a retreat or a holiday dinner, we have to go off-site to a church like this or some other place to accommodate everyone. We now have a much larger uh, space, and we do open it up to the community. And so um, um, it's just a matter of getting on the calendar. And I'll right. work on that when I get back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, I also, you know, being an old person, remember um, in 1986 when Mercy Care Outreach began as Mercy Mobile Health Care Clinic and was born at, at the health team of the task force with Tim Porter O'Grady from St. Joseph's as the leader of that team. And I remember when we sat around the table and worked on the first grant for the first mobile unit. That, that's been a long time. Many of y'all were born then, but it's been a long time. And in January, the task force will both celebrate and grieve the fact that we are 30 years old. So the good news is we're here and we are still serving people every single day. And in spite of the pressures, we haven't missed one day or one hour being open to the 500 or so people who come every day. So it's been a long time and it's been, and it's also the bad news that we're still here and that homelessness is now documented on computers by all of us. The first you know, in those first few years, we knew the names of every woman who was homeless, certainly. We met with the men and did surveys because we could find just about everybody. And we kept records of the babies who were born to homeless mothers. And we visited the hospital. We had that kind of ability because the numbers were small. Today, we're all keeping those numbers in computers, and there's no way we can track or have relationships with every single person who comes through our doors that way. But we, we are so grateful that at this point in our lives, in 2010, the task force is nearly totally run by residents. And some of us who are here still, like, thank God, Valerie Dawson and Miss Juanita and Jim and me, and some alumni of our programs like Johnson Ashu and Jack Jackson and a newbie in our programs who's one of the best case managers I've ever seen, Maurice Lattimore. We are so lucky that finally the folks who use the services are running the services. And that's been our mission and our goal, one of them. First of all, to end homelessness and prevent it, but then to understand and to make sure the community understands that the only difference between homeless people and us is that some of us are lucky enough to have held on to our housing because we have better support and more access to resources, and that's the only difference. 
So um, there have been a lot of changes, most of, most of them negative changes, policy decisions that are making uh, rolling us back 30 years that are happening as we speak now. And, you know, we, we sort of talk about activism and a lot of folks who are service providers are not, don't have time for, for real activism. But we think that we can be grown up enough to include all of those actions, the service delivery, the advocacy, the litigation, the education, the volunteering, the public experience, we can include all of that because it's gonna, it takes all of that to change a culture like ours and a system like we have in the United States. And y'all, we've got more work to do than we have since I was born, 16, almost nine years ago. We really have a lot to do. And we are better at what we do. We offer better services. We know more about what we do. But that is not changing the system. You know, the lack of good services didn't create homelessness. The lack of housing and the lack of income and resources to afford the houses there that's here creating homelessness. So we can be the best in the world and we're not going to impact that system at all unless some of us who are included with all of us take it to another level and really make the advocacy <coughs> heard in whatever ways, peaceful ways we can. So some of us like Joe Beasley, who's lost right now, trying to find us here, um, <laughs> is brave enough and out there enough to get arrested periodically when the issues require that kind of that kind of standing in the gap. And I hope he gets here because he was just he was just out of the hospital, and the day we were trying to find out if he was okay, somebody said he can't answer the phone. He's in jail. <laughs> so. He is one of these people who puts his body and soul and mind and strength on the line when he needs to. And if he gets here, we, we'll welcome him and hear about his most recent experience. And it was in, in defense of and, and on behalf of undocumented students who are being excluded from our uh, institutions of higher learning. And many of us stand very firmly in support of their having access. So, Anyway, that was another parenthetical aside. All right, Johnson, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, my name is Johnson Ashfu. I uh, used to, uh, three years ago, I used to the Pine, and I was a volunteer at the traditional housing program. And um, I left uh, Atlanta and uh, went to Boston, where I'm currently. Uh, I, I resided in Boston for last year and I, I'm currently working on a novel that I have to do for the company to work on. So when I heard last year that the mine was about to be foreclosed, I thought, well, I have always thought that at some point we would have an obsession with this novel, I would come back and help out. So I said, well, there's no better time to do that than now. So I decided to come back to uh, try to see what, what we are doing. Uh, the building that has meant so much to me. Because um, when I was in Atlanta as a student at Georgia State, um, like two years before I graduated, I had a problem where I needed a place to stay. I couldn't, you know, afford housing. I lost my job. And um, it was either I had to quit school and get two hefty jobs to be able to pay my apartment or, you know, live somewhere close by and walk to school and pay. So I came to the Pine one day and uh, <coughs> I met um, people who you know, received me and it was the only home I had for the two last three years of college, you know, senior and junior, uh, junior and senior year. So for me, uh, that place has been the only home I've had in the band. It's the only for me that's, that is there for me when I needed a place, you know. And so when I heard that it was about to foreclose, I felt like this I could go to come back and have a mind and whatever it is. So I'm going to be here for a year and then after that, you know, I don't know. I'm going to work with the with the meter and the people at the time for one year. So that's what's going to And yeah, also he won't say this, but he graduated summa cum laude from Georgia State and and then had a summer fellowship to Stanford University where they offered him a graduate fellowship. And instead of that he decided he needed to see the world and um, and come back growing up, which he has done. And we it was like the cavalry coming. Oh, I'm coming.
Hello, I'm Stephanie Quinn. I'm with the American Lung Association of Georgia. We house um, TB, lung disease patients, or homeless TB patients, and um, we also do financial assistance. We try to get the homeless people back out into the work field community. We try to get them um, job placements, services. Um, we try to get them back on food to get their food stamps. We help them get their ID, birth certificates, anything that they need to try to get back in, into society.
And uh, I did several years uh, at, the, at the, what they call the team level, and then I went to operations and intelligence, where I was always at the battalion or the theater level, uh, especially with JOTC, because a branch of Pope Evans space that combined teams, seals, and whatnot, strike me. Uh, and then I went to reserve, I got married, and I had 15 years of marriage. Uh, but then one day, um, I looked around and everything I had, I, I was losing everything I had. And uh, lost my wife, uh, lost, really lost contact with my family. Uh, I lost my job in the middle of all of that, uh, and all my assets. And in the middle of all that, I, I, I one day ended up down in the task force. And, and I don't know, maybe, maybe they can tell you, but you know, they, 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 they probably got a lot of good things to say about me, but the one thing they, they, they definitely say, which is true, is that Jack Jackson, well, he, he's a stubborn guy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, because, the one thing I, I love about Task Force is no matter where you come from, no matter what you've done, no matter how you got there, they open their arms. It's like you know in, in, in the song that David said, on the wings of evil, on the wings of eagle, eagles I will cover you and watch you. Well, there's three ladies over there at Task Force and there's one gentleman who's starting to really become special to me that took me under their wings. And they told me that, Jack, you know something? You are good as you say you are. They said, but think about this. A man loses his job, he loses his family, he loses his home, he loses all his assets, and he's out here trying to struggle, scratch and scrape to get it all back together, to get back on his feet, so to speak, and move on with his life. Look at how you got here, and look at the way you're thinking right now. So they told me that what I, what I need to do is sit down and rest for a while, sit down and let somebody counsel me. And they gave me counsel about Sometimes you should let the Lord take his way. Sometimes, you're, <clears throat> sometimes you may be right, but you got to let it see in. And you can't go out here and demand what you want just because you think you deserve it. So what they really told me was, after you go through a lot of circumstances and controversy, and you're out here on the street uh, trying to eat every day and trying to sleep every day, and, and trying to go back and find things that are helping you move forward in life, you can start thinking in a way that can scare people. Because they say, well, you know, we've seen it all before, but this guy here, he's, he's not going to, you know, he's, he, just, he just needs to sit down and rest. It's, it's called confusion. It's called confusion. Because you've got so many things to do, and you don't have nothing to do them with, you know? You don't know which direction to go. You end up in confusion. And so if there's one thing I think about task force, and, and I know task force has been a subject of a lot of things now, is that you can always go in the task force, no matter who you are, no matter where you come from, no matter what you do. And there will be someone there who's going to take you under their wing. And they're going to sit down and they're going to find a direction for you, not just based on clinical psychology, but based on what the Lord put on their heart. And if anyone wants to ask me what is the best way for a person to get his counsel, it's from someone who loves you. So I say to you, not only does task force help people, but they really truly in their hearts love people. And if you don't believe it, just look at myself, look at Mr. Lattimore, and Mr. Fisher here, and then look at those 
three ladies right there, and right now, Mr. Baby's stepping up to the plate. <laughs> stepping up to the plate. And there are three people who, even at the risk of their own personal, personal things in life, are still there with their arms over people, trying to lead them out of poverty, trying to get them off the streets, trying to reconnect them with their families, just trying to do the right thing. So I just want to say, my name is Jackie Jackson. I'm a case manager for Task Force. Hi, uh, I'm Mike Burke, and um, <clears throat> I'm here for a number of reasons, just to kind of plug in. I work with, uh, peripherally, with the uh, National Association for Black Veterans, uh, which I have helped get office space down at uh, uh, Friends, American Friends Service Committee, so I help them very uh, lightly with some of the processing they do, because so many, uh, so many of our homeless are veterans, uh, about 30%, and I'm looking forward to uh, possibly working with uh, uh, Jack Jackson on uh, uh, bringing some veterans together to work on a survival uh, program for the task force that will tap into the, uh, the military surplus in cold weather survival gear, blankets, sleeping bags, and uh, parkas and that sort of thing, and make it a long-term project. And the other thing I'm involved in uh, is my, uh, uh, really my passion, it's uh, called Safe Passage, uh, Safe Passage Network, and we're looking at the, we're looking at the whole 13-year pipeline that our children are faced with K through 12, kindergarten through 12th grade, and that's where we're feeding this uh, Pentagon pipeline for, regardless of what your views are around the military, uh, all wars are not right. And uh, that's, we're trying to educate the public to, to reassess, to reassess their views on what's taking place in our public school classrooms. My name is Kara Clark, uh, by way of Chicago, Illinois. Um, I've been in the community uh, for two months now, and I've been volunteering. Patsy invited me at the local church food bank. I see a big problem here. I've traveled extensively. I see a terrible, terrible uh, devastation. I want to do something about it. I'm not quite sure how I'm going to do that. So my first thing is to come here and see what's available to the community, and then see what I can do to assist them. So I'm not with any program other than my own personal observer. So I'm here. Well, you might just be gobbled up. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody need to volunteer? <laughs> what can we bring you for? Uh, I'm Tom Bell. I am uh, relatively new to Atlanta. We moved here with my wife just uh, under two years ago. We joined the church here at Epiphany. And one of the uh, outreach activities that this parish is involved in is supporting the task force with monthly feedings, and uh, my wife and I have both been involved with that for a year or so. And I saw on your Facebook post that we were meeting this month here and said I was going to be down here at 2 o'clock anyway to be cooking for tomorrow night's meal. Mm -hmm. I certainly need to be here for this lunch, so I'm glad to be part of this group. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Hi, I'm Patsy Cornick, and I'm um, with Virginia's Bible Book Club, but I always enjoy coming to the task force meeting and thought I would invite Kara since I met her over at the church for about, I told you all about the uh, uh, food pantry we have going on over in the Bolton community and uh, just enjoy networking with you guys and trying to see what else I can do. Um, also, the December 21st vigil that Mercy Healthcare is doing is important to all of us because it is an opportunity for us to join them and join a lot of folks in prayer to deplore the condition of homelessness and to thank God for the lives of people who serve and who survive homelessness and to remember those who did not survive this year and, and last year. 
It's very important and a moving experience. And we will be there and we've offered to bring our crosses, which we've marked with the names of all the folks who died um, this year as we walked up the aisle at the cathedral and put on the cathedral altar on the first. And the National Coalition for the Homeless is an organization we've been members of for 25 years and I've been on the board of for 25 years. They always have marked December 21st as the first day of winter, the longest night of the year. In the past, what, what the National Coalition did was issue a policy report, a white paper on that date about the causes and conditions and the life and death nature of homelessness. And of course that's close to all of our hearts because the task force was called together 30 years ago because 17 men froze to death on the streets of this city. And so Mary Jane called people from the faith community, the business community, the local government, and some homeless people together and formed the Task Force Coalition. So it matters so much for us to acknowledge the weather and the dangers of living homeless. Also, we, we, we now have study after study that shows that people who live homeless are likely to die 25 years sooner depending on the length of the homelessness and whether it was on the street homelessness. Mm -hmm. But people who've lived on the streets are likely to die 25 years sooner than those people who are housed. We're also looking at studies that say mm -hmm. that, and this is amazing, 80% of people who are homeless, and this is fairly new, uh, are not homeless for longer than maybe 40, 45 days. 80%. The 25% who are episodically homeless or who are homeless because they are too ill to be able to manage housing on their own and they can't access it, are what the government calls chronically homeless. We, we'd rather say people are homeless, but we are chronically unable or unwilling to provide housing resources for them. So we're the chronically ill ones. You know, so, that stat is amazing to us because the 20% of so-called chronically homeless are the only people this government has concentrated on for the last almost 12 years. So the economically displaced, which is the percentage that's growing by leaps and bounds as the foreclosure crisis trickles down to the level of the street and cars and abandoned buildings, the stats are going to change dramatically. And we have to be very sure that we're part of that conversation to say, let's, let's back it up a little bit. It's not just about chronically homeless. It's about the economic conditions that are forcing people, forcing people who are working. And 40 to 45% of people at, at Fishery Pine are working. But they have to have two and a half minimum wage jobs. Just to Next month we'll have our holiday meeting which is pretty festive, and we always have it in the dining room at the task force. And we serve a festive meal, and we have um, giveaways, and we're going to do um, the white elephant game. Anybody who's going to play that at the task force, you should bring your football equipment, because it gets rough. Uh, uh -huh. um, it's very much fun. Bring, please bring a wrapped white elephant gift, something stupid, silly, Oh, really wonderful. It doesn't matter. Something you, you want to give away, but wrap it up. And we'll play that game as well as we will reward everybody who's been uh, providing energy and efforts and services above and beyond the call of duty for the people we serve. And um, it just matters so much to us to thank everybody in this network. Um, and please bring anybody you want to, especially folks we call guests, clients, <coughs> partners, we, we use different names, um, patients, bring somebody and let's enjoy that time together. We'll also have a distribution of some donated items that we get and we always like to give away what we get. We have a lot of folks now who need coats and mostly blankets and sleeping bags and that and toiletries. But whatever we get, we always manage to be able to give a lot away to the network, and we will do that at that meeting. You'll be reminded of it, and it will be in our dining room. And I know Mercy had not, last time we had a meeting, y'all got booted. We're not gonna we're gonna be guarding the parking lot this time. 
No booming. Yeah, it was a nightmare. It was a nightmare. We, we, we felt bad about that until now. We still do. But we will make arrangements that the park will be guarded the parking lot. And it's a, it, it is two dollars for the parking. But the boot man sort of sits on the top level and watches. And it comes zeroing down and boots guards. It's not, not nice, but we'll, we'll be guarding it. Um, I just want to say a couple of things and ask Dr. Betty to come up a minute, please, sir. Can you do that? There is a, a gallery show at the Auburn Avenue Research Library right now that you've got to see, y'all. You've got to see. And it is uh, called Sheltering Justice, and it's a real professional, beautiful, well done photography and painting exhibit. And it's about and by the people who live at Peachtree Vine. Uh, Dr. Chuck Steffen took the black and white photographs over a period of two years. He has exhibited professionally for a long time, so he is a professional photographer. And then he offered to share that exhibition with our artists. And we don't, call, we don't say, oh, we have homeless artists. We say we have artists in residence. Because that's the way you talk about people who live and pay where they live. They are incredible. And there are paintings that they have done. There's a painting done by a professional artist who's, who's now <coughs> in the ranks of, of world-renowned uh, figure painters. He came back just for the opening of that exhibit, but it'll be up to January. So don't miss it. Please go by and look at it. It's quite a wonderful exhibit. 